Good afternoon and welcome to a special collaboration between the Minneapolis Idea Exchange, which Tim just explained to you, Mix, and the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Becky Roloff and I am truly honored to have been asked to moderate today's panel. So thank you, Tim, and thank you, Susan. I am president and CEO of the YWC of Minneapolis. While we are not quite as old as Westminster, we have been serving this community since 1891, 125 years. This past year, well, thank you. I think we look pretty good for being 125 years old. This past year, we served over 30,000 people through our mission, which is the elimination of racism and the empowerment of women and girls. We care deeply, along with Westminster and you, about this being a healthy and vibrant community. So today's speaker reaches us with a very timely message. This event is being broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church, located at Nicollet Mall and across the street from the YWC of Minneapolis in downtown Minneapolis, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dan Butner. Dan is the New York Times best-selling author and a National Geographic Fellow whose groundbreaking research on longevity has been captured in three bestsellers. Blue Zones, Nine Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who Lived the Longest, Thrive, Finding Happiness the Blue Zone Way, and The Blue Zone Solution, eating and living like the world's healthiest people. And I didn't think of that when I wore his colors today. So, uh, but he noticed, so I appreciated that. He is the founder of the Blue Zones organization, which is committed to helping Americans live longer and healthier lives by adopting the habits and the choices of elders who are living to record-setting ages in five areas of our globe. He and his Blue Zones team, which he'll tell you about, are bringing these lessons in longevity to cities and businesses across our country, including the town of Albert Lee, Minnesota, where participants have raised their life expectancy and, I think importantly, lowered health care costs and, I would imagine, increased joy by nearly 40%. Today, our guest speaker will share his ideas for transforming a city as large and diverse as Minneapolis into a Blue Zones community. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm, wonderful October 2nd Minneapolis welcome to the Westminster Town Forum and Minneapolis Idea Exchange, Dan Butner. What a thrill, and thank you for the warm introduction. It's an honor to be part of Westminster Town Hall Forum, and uh, plus I know my mother will be very pleased when she discovers I was in church on a weekday. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the lessons from the longest lived people around the world, what they have to teach us as individuals, and perhaps more importantly, what they have to teach communities about producing longer lived and healthier people. Something called the Danish Twin Study established um, uh, about 10 years ago that only about 20% of how long the average person lives is dictated by genes. The other 80% is dicta dictated by lifestyle and environment. So there's good news and bad news in that. Uh, the good news is that if your parents died young, it doesn't mean you have to. And the bad news is if your parents live long, healthy lives, it doesn't mean you have a free pass. Uh, but based on that finding, about a decade ago with National Geographic and with funding from the National Institutes on Aging, we set out in a sense to reverse engineer longevity. Uh, we worked with demographers to identify five pockets around the world where people are living measurably longer. And then we struck off to discover exactly what they've been doing most of their lives. And we work with anthropologists and epidemiologists and medical researchers, a whole team, uh, for decades now, for over a decade now. And um, we found in Okinawa, Japan, the world's longest-lived women. 
Uh, this is a place where uh, traditionally nobody is lonely. They're put in these um, committed social networks called Moais. We never think of loneliness much when it comes to longevity, but if you're lonely in this country, it shaves about eight years off your life expectancy. We found the longest lived men in Sardinia, Italy, up in the highlands, a cluster of 14 villages, 42,000 people, mostly shepherds. But most interesting, more than their diet or their exercise programs, uh, they celebrated age. The older you got, the more celebrated you were. People in their 90s and 100s continued to uh, advise the mayor and uh, live with families where they made um, tangible contributions. Uh, in Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, we found a population that reaches age 90 at a rate two and a half times greater than we do in America, and they do so spending about one-tenth the amount we do in health care. In the United States, among the Seventh-day Adventists, in uh, Loma Linda, California, another population that lives a long time, they take their diet directly out of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God talks about every plant that bears seeds and every tree that bears fruit. And as a result, they're mostly vegans. Uh, and then, uh, just last week, in fact, I revisited our fifth and probably the last blue zone on the earth, in Korea, Greece, a place where people live about eight years longer than Americans do. It's a far-flung, tiny island off the coast of, uh, off, off the coast of Turkey. Uh, but they also produce a population of 10,000 people with about one-fifth the rate of dementia. They live a long time, and they stay sharp to the very end. How do they do it? I like to tell a story that sums it up best. Uh, in Icaria, I met a fellow by the name of Stamitis Moriaitis. He was 22 years old. He came from, from Icaria to the United States, moved to Detroit. Uh, Hard-working guy, immediately got a job, house painter, made money, bought a Chevrolet, bought a house in the suburbs, got married to a Greek-American woman, had three kids. But at age 66, he found himself short of breath, his doctor diagnosed him, three doctors diagnosed him with lung cancer. He was going to be dead in six months. Get your affairs in order. Instead of staying in Detroit, he moves back to Korea. Moves in with his parents who are still alive. He and his wife move in. So those of you who think you have it bad with college students returning back from college. <laughs> but he starts breathing the air, eating this Mediterranean diet. He reconnects with his religion. His friends come over after, every afternoon. They find out he's home. Uh, he drinks a little bit of wine every day. Six months come and go. He's supposed to be dead, but he's actually feeling pretty good. So he grows a garden. Never expects to be around the harvest of the garden. But he thinks in his mind, well, my wife will harvest these vegetables, and she'll think of me when I'm gone. Well, to make a long story medium, 34 years later when I met him at age 102, he not only harvested that garden, he planted a vineyard which produced 200 liters of wine every year, all of which he drank. <laughs> <clears throat> so when I asked him, you know, what his secret to longevity was, you know, I expected a profound answer, and he just uh, looked over at me and he responded, well, he shrugged, I guess I just forgot to die. <laughs> and that sounded like a flippant answer on the surface, but actually it gave voice to what I've been realizing now in about a half, half a dozen years of, of studying long-lived culture. And that was in no place, in none of these longevity hotspots where you're finding spry hundred-year-olds water skiing and standing on their heads, did any of them ever try to live a long time? None of them said at age 50, well, go darn it, I'm going to get on that longevity diet and live another 50 years. Uh, none of them bought a treadmill or joined a gym or called an 800 number and started buying supplements to live a long time. In every case, no matter if you go to Asia or Europe or Latin America or the United States, where people are living a long time, longevity happened to them. It was not something they pursued. It's something that ensued. And this is a big epiphany. This is a big aha moment because in America, most of what we spend our money on, most of the effort and resources and businesses, the government level, healthcare, is all about proactively trying to get healthier. 
And here are confirmed populations that are the healthiest in the world, they don't even try. No matter where you go in the world, you see people living a long time, you see the same set of characteristics happening. Number one, they, they don't necessarily exercise. This is gonna sound like a bit of a heresy, uh, but exercise in this country has been an unmitigated public health failure. Americans burn fewer than 100 calories a day engaged in exercise. Fewer than 20% of Americans get the recommended amount of physical activity. You look in blue zones, they don't exercise, but they live in environments where it's easy to move. Their streets aren't built just for automobiles, as most streets in America are. Uh, they're built for humans, so that every time they go to work or to school or to a friend's house, it occasions a walk. Their houses are deconvenienced. There's not a button to push for housework, another button to push for yard work, another button to push for kitchen work. They're getting in there kneading that bread with their hands or grinding corn by hand or doing yard work by hand. Uh, our team figured out they're nudged into movement every 20 minutes or so. And when you add that up, all these little bursts of physical activity, it's burning more calories than you would by sitting in your office all day long, your house all day long, and then expecting to make it up in the gym. Moreover, they're keeping their metabolisms at higher levels. They suffer the same stresses that we do, but they have ancient daily rituals to reverse the stress and the inflammation that comes with worry and hurry and being on our devices. They pray, meditate, take naps, or do happy hour. <laughs> they have vocabulary for purpose. This is a big idea. We don't pay much attention to purpose when we think about creating greater health, but Robert Butler, who I happen to know, he was the first director of the National Institutes on Aging, did a huge study on purpose and found that people who could articulate their life meaning, their sense of purpose, were living about seven years longer than people who were rudderless in life. In blue zones, there's vocabulary for purpose. The Costa Ricans have plan de vida. The Okinawans have ikigai, the reason for which I wake up in the world in the morning. Uh, they eat mostly a plant-based diet. Ninety percent of their dietary intake, no matter where you go, you look uh, at the past hundred years, dietary surveys of the past hundred years in all blue zones, ninety percent of all the uh, calories they take in come from plants. Uh, very anti-paleo, by the way. Sixty-five percent of all their calories come from complex carbohydrates. Grains, rice, tubers. Longest lived women in the world for more than half of their lives over 60% of all the calories they consume came from sweet potatoes, Okinawa. Longevity diet in the world everywhere. The cornerstone is beans. Black beans in Costa Rica, soybeans in Okinawa, lentils, garbanzos. Uh, if Americans could somehow figure out how to get about a cup of beans into our diet every day, uh, we would add about three to four years of extra life expectancy. Maybe because of the fiber, the protein, but probably more likely because it's pushing out less healthy proteins. In Blue Zones, people did eat meat, but only on average about five times a month. Uh, it was not a deprivation diet. These people weren't depriving of themselves. They ate about 1,100 meals a year, like we do, 365 days a year, three times a day. 100 of those meals were blowout. They'd slaughter a pig, drink all night, eat goat liver, etc. But a thousand of those 1,100 meals, the default meals that just fuel them through the days, were mostly simple plant-based meals. They did enjoy life. Uh, then the foundation of Blue Zone cultures everywhere, they put their family first. They're actually investing in older people. They're not looked at as recipients of health care, but people imbued with a responsibility, recognized for their accumulated wisdom, and that wisdom is put to work. There's actually an expectation of older people to do something other than move to Florida or Arizona, but to stay here and put those decades of, of uh, work experience or life experience to work. Um, they belong to faith-based communities. It uh, doesn't matter if they're Christian or Muslim or, or Buddhist. They show up four times a month, which we know is associated with about four to 14 extra years of life expectancy. I don't know if today counts or not, but we'll just say it does. <laughs> And then in all these places, and this is a huge point, they're surrounded by people that support the right behaviors. We now know that if your three best friends 
are unhealthy and obese, there's a 150% better chance that you'll be overweight. So who you're spending Tuesday nights with or your weekends makes an enormous difference. So curating those five friends around you, friends who are vegetarian or plant-based, whose idea of recreation is playing tennis or gardening or bowling or walking, people who actually care about you and keep you engaged. Because when it comes to longevity, there's no short-term fix. There's no pill, there's no supplement, there's no hormone um, that's going to help you live longer. If you're not doing it for the long run, it doesn't work. In Blue Zone, these people are living up to a decade longer than we are, 12 times as many centenarians in some areas, one-fifth the rate of the big chronic diseases that are bankrupting our country. How do we get what they want? Well, in this last book, I tried to answer that question. I got another grant from National Geographic in about 2008 and set out to look for cultures that were unhealthy and got up healthy. After all, that's a big problem in our country right now. How do you get populations healthier? And I did my research, worked with the CDC, World Health Organization, locally, Dr. Bob Kane at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Tom Cockey at Health Partners, uh, the world-renowned health expert, Ramar Sutton, uh, help me. Um, I looked for places where people were unhealthy and got healthy, and my dismay, there are a, uh, absolutely none in America. So I have no examples of big cities starting out trying to get healthier and actually succeeded. We found one place in the world where our entire population got healthier. It's a place called North Karelia, Finland. Looks a lot like Minnesota, in fact. It's on the border with the Soviet Union, or former Soviet Union, Russia now. 145,000 people in 1972, this little enclave, 14 villages, had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease in the world. White guys, age 55, dropping dead of heart attacks. These guys were mostly dairy farmers and pig farmers. Their diet, not surprisingly, had a lot of milk, dairy products, and pork in it. They woke up in the morning and uh, they had a 16-ounce glass of whole milk for breakfast. They fried their cheese and butter. And the national dish was something called North Karelia stew, which had three ingredients, water, fatty pork, and salt. And if you wanted it spicy, you added more salt. So not surprisingly, there's a big heart disease problem. Um, a young firebrand public health graduate named Pekka Pushka was tapped to fix his problem. And he goes from Helsinki to North Karelia and starts doing the same thing that public health uh, workers have done forever. Uh, the typical um, strategy is to identify the people at highest risk and then you unleash all your resources at those. And that works very well for cholera or malaria or a, a SARS breakout. Uh, but it turns out Pekapushka is working with a brand new type of disease, a chronic disease. Before 1972, when daddy died of a heart attack, you said, you know, he died of old age. They didn't realize that um, diabetes and chronic disease were, were lifestyle problems. And Pekapushka tried to do the typical things that public health officials did. They tried to identify people with high blood pressure and cholesterol and... Um, tried to aim an intervention at those people and found out he wasn't, after five years or so, making any progress at all. He teams up with an epidemiologist named Jeffrey Rose, who statistically figured out that when it comes to public health, you do not want to fight with a rifle. You want to fight with a shotgun. Your time and resource and money is best spent at unleashing a small intervention on the entire population rather than a heavy intervention on the people most at risk. So Pekka Pushka looked at the system. People were eating way too much fat, way too much animal pro pro products, and they're dying of heart disease. He looked first at dairy. He got legislatures to change the incentives so that farmers aren't producing milk with high butter fat, but milk with just high volume, slightly he healthier milk. Um, he recognized that uh, um, if you didn't want people frying their cheese and butter using some other kind of uh, frying uh, oil that they needed to bring vegetable oil, but the problem with vegetable oil, it all came from Italy, it was olive oil, it was too expensive, so he worked with 
food scientists to create a type of uh, canola oil that could be produced up that far north. Um, he recognized that people need to eat more fruits and vegetables, so he taught farmers' wives how to cook with vegetables. And then when it came to fruits, not many fruits grew in Finland, but berries grew very well, raspberries and blueberries, but only for a month a year. He helped start a, a cooperative that took those berries and froze them and put them in products so they're available all year long. And in North Karelia, people love their sausage. And there's no way he was going to get people to stop eating their sausage, just like we're never going to get Vikings fans to stop eating hot dogs. But he went to the sausage maker, convinced the sausage maker to add mushroom filling and to take out some of the fat and salt. And six months later, lo and behold, people were eating the same amount of sausage, but little did they know they were eating 30% less fat and 20% less salt. So he just kept mulching through the entire uh, community, making these system-wide uh, population level changes. Uh, and after a decade, he brought down the cardiovascular disease rate by 80% and the cancer rate by 60%, and he's maintained it today. This is in the British Journal of Medicine. This is in, I wrote about it in the um, uh, Atlantic Monthly magazine in April, if anybody's interested. But it is an absolute miracle that's largely overlooked for some reason. I tried to look for an example in Minnesota, actually, a smaller example in, in, um, in preparation for this speech, and I actually found one. There's actually a big success story right here in Minneapolis. Where Highway 94 hits the river, there is a neighborhood in southeast Minneapolis called Seward. It's a neighborhood largely built by railroad workers, the old Milwaukee Railroad, immigrants. It thrived in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. But then in the 1950s, when cars started to dominate and the train trade kind of diminished, the uh, neighborhood, he rolled it. In the 1960s, it was in bad shape. A few neighbors took the reins. It was called the Seward Neighborhood Group. They worked with the school district and developers and created Matthew Center so that there was a nucleus to the neighborhood, a place for people to meet, a place for kids to recreate. They helped build the Seward Co-op so that there was an affordable place for people to get healthy food. Another set of neighbors created Milwaukee Mall, which is this amazing, amazing two streets off of Franklin. If you haven't seen it, you should go see it. They, they ripped up the pavement and put this beautiful tree-lined mall in front of their houses and created these environments where neighbors connected and it was easy to walk. They helped shape policies and ordinances so that there are bike lanes. There aren't many junk food restaurants on Franklin Avenue. There's a, a tree-lined sidewalk, so it's pleasant to walk. 19, in 2013, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation picked Minneapolis as one of three cities to do a longevity study. They found that in Seward, and the surrounding areas, the life expectancy there was 13 years greater than it was in neighborhoods just three miles east on 94, i.e. Frogtown, and just three miles west of 94, i.e. St. Louis Park. Does that mean that Frogtown and, and uh, St. Louis Park, the people there, are somehow less disciplined, or they have uh, inferior gyms, or inferior diets? No that the neighbors took the reins and decided to create an environment that would promote health. I don't have to tell this audience that there's a huge health problem in this country. Almost 70% of us are overweight or obese. About 40% of us are heading towards diabetes, a disease that costs about $72,000 a year to treat. Right now, we spend about $2.1 trillion a year on health care. Most of it, 84% or so, is avoidable. And for the first time in living history, life expectancy of our children is expected to be as much as five years less than the life expectancy of us, our life expectancy. Is that because we're stupid? or we somehow lack the discipline of our forefathers or lesser people, or we love our kids less than our parents loved us? No. 
our environment has changed. 1970, there were a third as many overweight people, but there wasn't as much sprawl. We drove half as many miles a year as we do right now. There were about a 15th as many fast food restaurants. It was harder to just go out to eat. Nowadays, you can't walk through a pharmacy, pick up cough medicine, or walk through an airport, or drive to your neighbor's house without being routed through a gauntlet of fast food, salty snacks, soda pops, and candy bars. Discipline is a good thing. Individual responsibility, we hear a lot about individual responsibility, a good thing. But the problem is, discipline is a muscle, and muscles fatigue, and eventually our evolutionary hardwiring is going to take over, and we're going to grab that food when we see it. We're going to take rest when we can. How many of you walked to school when you were a kid? Raise your hand. How many of you walked to school? Okay, about 90% of you have your hands up. Now raise your hand if your kids walk to school. I see about 10 hands in the whole audience. Why is it? We have a childhood obesity epidemic and our kids don't walk to school. Well, of course, part of it is we're afraid that our kids will get hit by traffic or that they'll be snatched. But the reality is zoning has changed and those little neighborhood schools we grew up with are largely disappeared and it's aggregated out uh, into the periphery where land is cheap. We made that decision. We can make it back and engineer in that physical activity back into our kids' lives. Every single day, about 375 images rinse over our brain, encouraging us to buy processed packaged food, 99% uh, of which isn't all that good for us. The secret to longevity, whether it's in your own homes or whether with the community, lies not in trying to beat the dead horse of individual responsibility, of diets and exercise programs and supplements. The secret, I argue, is look at the cultures, many of them, I hate to say, outside the United States that have done it better than we have. Look at the environmental components and import those environmental components in a culturally appropriate way. It's been done over and over and over again. We just have to pay attention to how. It all really boils down to making the healthy choice, not only the easy choice, but having the courage to make it the unavoidable choice. I want to close with one very quick illustrative story. Uh, remember Stomitis Moriaitis, the old guy who forgot to die? Drinks 200 liters of wine a year. I actually called him uh, uh, a while back. I was writing about him. I was sit sitting in the uh, Caribou Coffee on Hennepin. I called him in his little whitewash house in Icaria, Greece. It was late afternoon. He was just woken up from a nap, and I, um, I was asking him questions. And after about 15 minutes, he goes, you got to hurry this up. i got friends coming over. So I said, okay, just one last question. I said, did you ever figure out how you got rid of lung cancer. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I gave that a lot of thought. In fact, about 15 years ago, I went back to the United States to get some tests. And I said, yeah, what did you discover? He said, nothing. He said, I got back to the United States and all my doctors were dead. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
for the next Town Hall Forum on Tuesday, October 13th at 7 o'clock p.m. Patrick Kennedy, former congressman from Rhode Island and son of the late Senator Ted Kennedy, will speak on the topic, Treating the Pain of Mental Illness and Addiction, a Personal Journey. Forums are free, they're open to all, and further information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. Dan, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from the audience that um, the ushers will collect. But let's begin with this. When you were 16, what did you think you would do when you grew up? And is your mother surprised that you're standing in front of us talking about health? Yeah, when I was 16, I wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> yes, and my mother, uh, we, but, you know, before this, I actually, um, uh, I biked. I biked from Alaska to Argentina, around the world, and across Africa, top to bottom. It was all downhill. Uh, <laughs> but after that, I was pretty proud of myself. I came home, my mother said, what are you going to snap out of and get a real job? <laughs> but I think she's proud now. Oh, I'm sure she is. I read um, the entire book, um, Blue Zone. I'd highly recommend it. Um, I read every recipe, too, and I kept saying to my husband, we have to buy more beans, we have to buy more beans. Um, I, I turned to page 317, and I found something missing, though, on page 317 that I'd like you to comment on. In the M section, there was no comment on martinis. <laughs> so what's the difference on the red wine, hard alcohol? Can you comment on that? Because that's a major part of the liquids of coffee, water, tea, and red wine. And I thought the other people might be as interested as I was. Sure. So, um, well, up in Sardinia, we did find a red wine that has the highest level of polyphenols or artery scrubbing antioxidants in any other place in the world. It's called uh, uh, Cananao. And uh, th there's some argument for that red wine over other red wine, but actually, uh, drinkers actually outlive non-drinkers as a whole, which doesn't mean to say that if you're not drinking now or if you have a drinking problem, you should run out and start drinking more. But, but it does say that um, uh, people who drink one or two, and in Icaria, even three drinks a day, are outliving those that, that are, are, are teetotalers. And when I say two drinks a day, um, it can be martinis, it can be beer. There's some argument for red wine, uh, especially when it comes to uh, accompany with food. If you're drinking a glass of red wine with uh, food from a Mediterranean diet, you're about tripling the flavonoid uptake. So uh, there's kind of a two for there as far as I'm concerned. But by the way, you can't save up all week long and have 14 <laughs> on the weekend. Okay, so. well, I feel a little better. I feel a little better. So I'll add that into the index, um, into, into the book. In the blue zones, are elders genuinely respected and valued by young people? Yes, so in Okinawa, for example, is uh, the, the biggest day of your life, if you make, is your 97th birthday. The whole village will come out, and, and it, that's a, it's a big difference. Um, Okinawa, uh, this is, again, there's 30 times more female centenarians among uh, people over 60, um, women over 60 in Okinawa than we have here in the United States. And you start looking at why, and they don't have any genetic advantage. I mean, they eat mostly a plant-based diet, but there's, there's nothing magical. It's the sum of a bunch of small things. But I believe it's a huge difference, this notion that um, the older you get, uh, the more celebrated you are. Uh, and along with that, it's not just we honor our old. The old, have, there's an expectation that they're going to uh, contribute. So what gives them the motivation to get out of bed in the morning, to get out of the easy chair, to get their exercise, to stay engaged, to take their medicine, I really, is this purpose, and the purpose comes from an attitude from the culture that I think we could learn from. Okay. How do you account for and address racial disparities as it comes from access to healthy food and communities that might not have that access? Well, in, this, in my city work, uh, I try not to focus on one neighborhood or another. Uh, Food policy is a very effective uh, uh, instrument to get cities eating healthier. Um, if you look at a place like uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they have the highest rate of obesity 
uh, in the country, and they have uh, almost no strictures on how many fast food restaurants per square block or fast food advertising. Uh, then you look at a place like uh, San Luis Obispo, whose city council said a long time ago, we're taking these huge advertising, junk food advertising signs and making them smaller. They can't be bigger than a certain size. They invest in a citywide um, farmer's market, which is kind of a party every Thursday night. There's no drive-throughs at fast food restaurants, so it's more inconvenient. Uh, that making the uh, junk food harder and more expensive and making healthy food cheaper and more accessible, that cuts across all ethnicities, all economic boundaries, and, and uh, uh, lifts the tide that lifts all boats in the whole community. Okay. People were interested, several of you, a little bit more about the Albert Lee example. The Albert, the Albert Lee, Minnesota example. Oh, that was fantastic, Albert. So uh, in uh, 2008, I got uh, funding from AARP, United Healthcare, uh, to see if we could take these Blue Zones ideas and actually put them to work in a, in a community. And uh, the idea, again, was to make permanent changes to the environment, not get them all whipped up about a new diet. Uh, we actually auditioned five Minnesota towns, and we were really looking for a city where the mayor, the city manager, the superintendent of schools, the big CEOs, all would raise their hand and say, we're in. Because if you don't have a city that wants it, uh, you're not going to be effective. And uh, it's our experience that you have to uh, change the restaurants, the grocery stores, the schools, the city policies, and a critical mass of individual simultaneously. And if you can't hit that uh, critical mass, you don't go anywhere. And as it turns out, in about two years, we hit that critical mass. Uh, you, you stated some of the statistics, but it made big national news. And uh, there's still a blue zone today, a blue zone community today. And um, uh, I think really a shining example of how this can work in America. Okay. In the book, you talk about the concept of eating of 80% full. And this question was built on that, which is, what role has fasting, if any, played in blue zone communities? Fast, so, fasting. What role oh, has what fasting, fasting played? Yeah, so most blue zone communities, there is some fasting, especially at Korea, Greece, about half of their days in the calendar year, there's some fasting going on. Um, but the bigger idea, um, stop at 80%, actually comes from the Confucian adage, hata hachi boo, which is still observed in Okinawa today. If you ever lucky enough to sit down with an older person in Okinawa, before a meal, like a prayer, they'll murmur, hara hachi bu, which reminds them to quit eating when their stomachs are 80% full. And this is often manifested right at the plate. They'll leave 20% of it left on the plate. But more often than not, it's manifested at the counter. They'll pre-plate their food. This is a great tip to take home, by the way. Pre-plate the food, put the leftovers away ahead of time. Later, Cornell Food Lab did three sets of studies on the difference between pre-plating the food and eating it family style and found that people who pre-plate their food consume about 20 to 25 percent fewer calories. So um, it actually works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel that your next project should be to take on big agriculture? Uh, take on big I don't want to touch out the stick. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a great friend with uh, Dave Durenberger. Um, he, he helped us get our permits for biking from Alaska to Argentina, and I meet with him every Christmas. And um, he reminds me, he was a, he was a senator here, and uh, congressman here in, um, in Minnesota for many years, great guy. Uh, he reminded me that, that, that all government is local. And I think you get a lot more done working with uh, municipal governments than you do trying to take on the feds, because there's so much policy. I, I like to see things happen this year. So I, I keep focused on, on local communities. Great. Where does the phrase blue zones come from? There was many questions on this. Uh, from your jacket. Yeah. No. <laughs> no it's well, I, had, I had read the book, so I knew what to wear. Yeah. Okay. So my team of demographers, uh, Michel Poulon from Belgium and Gianni Pest from Sardinia, um, when they were working in the original uh, blue zone area in Sardinia, they were parsing census data and, and uh, honing in on this cluster of 14 villages. They had this big map on our ward room, and they were drawing concentric circles with a blue sharpie. So we just started calling the area inside the blue circle the blue zone. 
uh, it stuck in Sardinia, and then and then we uh, extended it to all five of these. Yeah, areas. don't you just <laughs> love stories like that about that? Yeah, blue had it been a red marker, they'd yeah. be red zones, right? But Glad it wasn't red. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good for blue zones. We all seem to be busy chasing whatever is called success. By your research, have you seen discussed how the blue zone people think about what success is? I, I think in a, as a rule, and this is especially strong in Icaria and Sardinia, uh, this whole idea of, of um, sort of business success is a back, back seat to A, their family. Family is always first. If you ask a um, centenarian in those places what, what, why they work their whole life, they're always going to say their kids or their grandkids. Um, or, or their community. They, they tend to have a very strong sense of community. I Icareans, for example, will uh, identify themselves first as Icareans and then only second as Greeks. Even in America, there are 12,000 Icareans. And if you meet them in Detroit or Port Jefferson or Florida, and you ask them uh, uh, what their nationality is, they'll say Icarean. And they're really Greeks. How does a, well, let me give the preamble because I'm sure most of us um, listened to the news yesterday and know that we had another tragedy in, in the part of the United States. So this relates to that. School shootings, gang violence, even suicide, all point to a lethal absence of hope. How does a healthy level of hope relate to the overall health of a person and a community? That's you're a good in church, question. remember you're in church, so this was a yeah. good question for a church. So. Well, first of all, in none of these blue zones, except for maybe Loma Linda, uh, can people just carry guns. So uh, I, I don't think that kind of disaster would, would happen. I, again, I think it, it's rooted not so much in hope and more in, um, in purpose, in vocabulary of purpose, and having that sort of lead um, uh, and living in the moment uh, more so than some imagined future that might be better than right here and right now. Okay. Who fights you? Who are the skeptics that you encounter as you take this message out? I don't have many skeptics. It, in, in, uh, you know, believe it or not, our biggest city is Fort Worth, Texas, which is the reddest city of the reddest state. Spencer, Iowa, uh, which is kind of the, the, the vortex of the Tea Party there, you'd think that we get pushback from them. But for the most part, all we do is come in and point out that their environment yields health or lack thereof, and we bring them a set of tools, and they choose what's right for them. I think Bloomberg, who tried to do similar things in New York with 16-ounce sodas and so forth, he kind of um, forced the issue as opposed to coming in with a menu of 30 or 40 things, all of which are like that, which would uh, make the default healthier, and then let people choose which ones. And it's that little nuance, I think, that makes the big difference. What are the strengths that Minneapolis would bring to becoming a blue zone city? And what do you think are the biggest challenges we would face if we wanted to become a blue zone city? First of all, if I was at, on a national basis, if I, a major city, uh, Minneapolis is an A, or maybe A minus, but we're we're especially some of the neighborhoods around here. I think uh, Uptown and Marion Park and Seward, as I talked about, uh, they're they're very quote unquote blue zone. I would say um, um, we're very walkable, we're, we're bikeable, we're tops in the nation in fitness and health. I think we do a gr a great job. I, I think we have to keep an eye on. Um, uh, uh, food policy. Uh, there's a number of things that uh, Minneapolis could be doing to, to make it a little bit harder for us to access junk food and easier for us to access healthier food and to continue the great work uh, that I actually think the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, plan here in Minneapolis does, uh, Minnesota, in, in making a bicycling uh, a, a viable choice for transportation. Do you know that people who ride their bike or take a bus to work have 11% lower rates of heart disease than people who drive to work. So right there, that's better than your insurance policy, better than your gym membership. Talk a little bit more about the 
the food and the fats that protect your brain from diseases like Alzheimer's. I know there was a lower rate in the blue zones, but people were interested in a little bit more since that's a disease that we all confront. This is actually amazing. And I, my team found this island in the Aegean Sea called Icaria. We found 97% of people over 60 and found about one-fifth the rate. We used the same test the National Institutes on Aging uses for cognitive health. Uh, we found one-fifth the rate of dementia that we have here in America. America, if you hit age 85, there's about a 50% chance you're suffering from dementia. Uh, there it was about a 20% chance or 10%. What you look, when you see how Icarians are living, they're eating the strictest version of the Mediterranean diet. So they're eating fish, drinking wine, beans, olive oil, et cetera, et cetera. But also interestingly, and this is coincidentally, I can't make it a prescriptive, most of their lives they drink three types of teas, a sage tea, an oregano tea, and a mint tea called catnip. Um, they drink them every day. We had those three teas sent to the University of Athens School of Pharmacology and found that all three teas were uh, strong anti-inflammatories and mild to strong diuretics, which is uh, essentially it's, it's a compound that makes you pee, but it also lowers your uh, blood pressure. So we believe that, that that chronic lowering of inflammation and blood pressure because of these teas may have contributed it, along with the Mediterranean diet, along with the fact that you can't find more than 100 yards of flat land on the whole island. So they're <laughs> always getting their work out. Dan, how much does the, the myth of individuality that you talked about, how do we change that or think about that in the United States? The individuality versus group? Oh, individual responsibility. Right. And, or, or individuality at topping out um, common good. Well, that's a tough one. I mean, it's... You see the, um, the, the happiest places in the world, like I wrote this other book on, on uh, happiness, and um, Denmark's widely, why, widely known as the happiest place in the world. They actually teach civics and how to reach consensus to kids before they're 15. Um, you're, I think you're either born one way or not, but uh, I think our schools could address this notion of being civically engaged earlier and probably produce a society that is more... Uh, less individualistic and more um, uh, community-minded. And uh, I think that not only contributes to happiness, but also longevity. Dan, what is your personal approach to living longer? Other than hanging out with ha, good people. Happy hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, live, I live in Minneapolis. I live right by the uptown area. Most of the time I bike to work. I know every neighbor on my street. Um, I have, uh, I, I eat mostly a plant-based diet. Uh, I used to be a fanatic uh, cyclist, and now I do things, gentle, low-intensity physical activity. I think the key is doing something you like every day when it comes to physical activity, not forcing yourself to get on a treadmill if you hate the treadmill. Um, I know that the happiest Americans uh, are socially interacting uh, between six and seven hours every single day. So I'm a naturally social people, person, so now I give myself permission to go out every night and be with my friends. Uh, um, all these things. Um, we know actually that volunteers, I volunteer my time in a variety of, I'm a big fan of the Minneapolis Foundation. Um, the volunteers we know have lower rates of heart disease, they have lower BMIs, and they have measurably lower health care costs. So, these are all things you don't hear much about them because people can't market things to you and make money off of them, uh, but they all add up. So some of a number of small things can yield a really um, a better, longer life. The role of quality of other environmental issues in the health of our communities, and particularly interest was in the role of water and the role of water quality. I think it's the same ethos. I think the same people who care about the environment tend to also care about health. I think they're just varieties of the same mindset that uh, are, are, are positive. I will say, however, except for Loma Linda, California, which is in the San Bernardino Valley and under a cloud of smog these days, 
Blue zones were very clean places. Um, clean air, clean water. Uh, they grew most of their food close to their homes. And uh, so you see very clearly that environmental health is, is uh, overlapping with bodily health. Dan, what's next for you? What's next? Well, I'm going to go back to happiness. I, I'm, I just got another assignment from National Geographic. And uh, uh, this um, idea of uh, world happiness, I'm trying to put together a consensus of the top statisticians and uh, um, happiness thinkers, that are usually economists or psychologists, to uh, form a consensus on what policies are most likely to yield life satisfaction in nations. And I think there's, uh, I'll, t I'll, I'll tip my hand to just one thing and then I'll sign off here, but um, we tend to think that maximizing GDP, so the wealthier the nation, the happier it is, but actually that flattens out at about $40,000 a year. The thing that most highly correlates with happiness in nature is equality. Uh, part of it is, is uh, economic equality, but gender equality and tolerance and trust. Policies that favor those are gonna deliver more happiness per dollar uh, than any augmentation of the economy or of industry. Wow. Well, I think we should all uh, thank Dan. We love firemen, but we're really glad you didn't become <laughs> one. So thank you, Dan. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.